Iraq says it is to capture the jihadist group Islamic State's financial chief in an operation outside its borders. Prime Minister Mustafa al kadimi tweeted that Sami Jassim al juburi was arrested in a complex external operation by the Iraqi National Intelligence Service. He added that Mr. Jassim, also known as Haji Hamid, was a deputy leader of IS under the late Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. The U.S. had offered $5 million reward for information leading to his capture. Mr. Jassim is alleged to have been instrumental in managing finances for Islamic State terrorist operations and has supervised the group's revenue-generating operations from illicit sales of oil, gas, antiquities and minerals after it seized last suites of Iraq and Syria in 2014. And joining me now for more on this is Global Affairs Analyst Calvin Dack. Good to have you join us. Good to be here. So this has been hailed as, as a huge blow to the Islamic State. Uh, is, is this really a huge blow, especially when you consider that the group has been largely decimated? Uh, how significant is this? Well, I think it's significant um, for the intelligence value um, that the, you know, the U.S. and Iraqi forces will have. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's any doubt that he'll be quickly replaced by the Islamic State, but it is, like I said, um, a great intelligence coup, and it also deals a um, kind of blow to the morale and momentum of the Islamic State that was already on the decline, even though they're so active, you know, they had been limited to small scale attacks in Iraq. So it definitely would deal with um, a morale blow as well. But wouldn't intelligence be um, dependent on how, how, how willing or how, how, uh, how much he's willing to cooperate with, with um, uh, security forces? Yes, that's true. Um, although just the, for, you know, the Islamic State leaders that are left behind to kind of fill the gap um, that's now lost with the financial head there, the fear of what he could be saying and the information he could be sharing at a minimum is going to disrupt operations because one of the main focuses of you know this, this surge for years has been trying to not only weaken Islamic State leadership but to kind of answer some questions as to where the financing came from and who's financing them around the world. So that is going to be extremely valuable information. Um, it's not been revealed as to where he was captured, but there the are reports unconfirmed. I, I must say that it, it's, it probably was in Turkey. Um, does this have any consequences if, if it were to be Turkey or any other country? Does it have con consequence for that country in terms of harboring um, a, uh, a terrorist, as it were? Yes, it, de it definitely will. And I think that it even, even until we find out where officially it happened. This is just a reminder that the threats that are posed by Islamic State, you know, to obviously Iraqi interests, but U.S. interests in the region and the interest of the other countries in the region, that this goes beyond Iraqi borders, that to effectively fight the Islamic State or any terrorist threat, it requires cooperation between countries. And so I think that will remind all of us that we have to have these um, these relationships because it's no longer a world where one country, say the United States or even Iraq alone, can handle this. It requires cooperation. But isn't that also a wake-up call, though, that whilst the world is dealing with terrorism and other security situations, um, there are some countries that are willing to take in um, terrorists and harbor them for whatever gain it, it is? Yes, and it erodes trust. And I'll say um, from the U.S. perspective, you know, that's one of the reasons why, um, for example, with Pakistan, U.S.-Pakistani relations haven't really recovered as much as they could have after, you know, bin Laden was in Pakistan. And I, I think incidents like this, where you mentioned countries that are allies of the United States, so if it was Turkey, for example, you know, it, it, there are going to be some tough questions that have to be answered about harboring, and the U.S. and other world powers are going to have to make clear what the consequences are for countries or any groups harboring um, terrorists that are being um, hunted. Beyond, um, beyond just saying, oh, let's um, sever diplomatic ties with these countries who harbor terrorists, um, what other sanctions, what, what are the um, repercussions or consequences should that be for such countries? 
Well, I think that um, one of the things that we've realized over the last 20 years is that relationships with allies, even those that are sometimes allies, sometimes foes, are always complicated. And there's never one dynamic that can end or continue a relationship. However, there are ways um, that the United States, for example, can impose pressure, like you mentioned, sanctions, but also military cooperation. Because while the U.S., for example, has on its sites who the threats to U.S. interests are in the region, other countries in the region, they also have threats to their own security, and sometimes those overlap. So withholding military cooperation for another country, for example, will also hinder their own efforts internally and externally. So I think that's one of the kinds of, you know, the system of carrot and sticks that the U.S. and other powers can use. So let's circle back to the operations of the terrorist group. Of course, we said earlier that the group has been largely decimated, but that's not to undermine the fact that it is still very active in countries like Afghanistan and Mozambique. Um, what sort of what capacity do you think that a group has in terms of its ability to organize and mobilize? Well, I think the biggest the biggest um, factor in that is going to be the countries where they're located. Um, how aggressively they are being pursued. It also, you know, with the Afghanistan withdrawal by the United States, um, a kind of a reset with the relations we have in the region, in countries where Islamic State and others might be located, we're going to have to make sure that, because, you know, everybody in the United States wants to take a hands-off approach, you know, um, ending those long wars, um, you know, getting out of the Middle East, and other parts of the world, but we can't do that. So that reset is going to have to really be, okay, how can the U.S. still have influence? How can the U.S. still cooperate to make sure Islamic State doesn't grow without being in a country like Afghanistan for two decades? Hmm. We'll see how all of this plays out in terms of um, intelligence from gotten from um, the, the chief finance officer of ISIS. Thank you so much for talking to us, Global Affairs Analyst Calvin Dack. Thank you.